Um, yes. Chair, if I may come in, um, it's Sonia speaking. Just to note that we're going into a four and a half hour load shedding at 11 o'clock. So I don't know how long my devices are going to hold out for. Chairperson, that note, uh, where I am, we're going into a six hour load shedding uh, at some time. Um, but can I suggest that uh, having looked at the agenda, if we can deal with the in-house issues before we actually go on to other matters, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, can you just move the agenda up, Enrico? Uh, uh, just to get the, okay, uh, up again. Okay, I think, I think we, are, we, are, we, are, we are happy now with the, with the agenda. Uh, the the in-house the in-house uh, matters, uh, Maria, as suggested by Honorable Honorable uh, Dango. Um, chairperson, the the only in-house matter was the electing of um, the election of the acting chairperson. But um, as soon as we we start, then we go straight into the public hearings. Oh, brilliant! Brilliant. Uh, then, uh, as uh, as uh, indicated, the only item on the agenda that uh, is uh, now remaining is the, the public hearing. Uh, no, uh, let us take this opportunity to... No, to, Chairperson, if I may, my apologies please. once again. Yes, there is the issue of the, the travel to the UK and the dates thereof. Uh, I've been in touch with both the staff and I've been in touch with Dirko. I think if we leave Germany out because it's over the Easter weekend, uh, that period, and only do the UK, we can actually get the trip off and going. I wonder if the staff would, would wish to comment upon that particular matter. Thank you, Honorable Dango. Maria? Is the team ready to deal with that? Or there's still a consultation that must happen? Um, Chief Person, um, Lupeka has indicated that he would be in contact with you. Um, I think that matter might be discussed at tomorrow's meetings. And we will also avail ourselves um, as the support staff to the Select Committee on Trade to be um, And we can actually go into that matter in more detail. Okay. But I think I think that that's fine. Let's 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 uh, defer the matter to tomorrow. Uh, we will then uh, probably then uh, uh, allow the team to have thorough engagement with their sister uh, management uh, team, and then uh, uh, indicate that uh, the the uh, public hearing is on the uh, performance protection and copyright amendment bills. Uh, the uh, members will remember that uh, this uh, uh, two bills uh, comes from the the first administration. Uh, it was uh, uh, referred back to Parliament by the president, and the, the process uh, got kickstarted. And uh, uh, the NA then was able to pass the bill, and then it was referred to to the National uh, Council of Province. And as a result of a, a process plan was uh, developed and adopted. Uh, and amongst them, uh, uh, we then had to engage with the, with the, uh, the public in terms of uh, their views uh, in response to the invite that we uh, afforded them. Uh, we, one without any waste of time, then uh, uh, indicate that uh, a team or participant will make presentation and then uh, probably just cut this in questions and then move to the other. I think if we, if we move in that fashion, then it becomes much more easier 
uh, to allow members to follow without uh, necessarily having to wait for the rest uh, of the presentations to be made. But uh, like I said, we'll have an opportunity as the committee to make a reflection in terms of uh, the presentation makes made, but what is quite critical is for us just to probably start some questions from the presentation. And in terms of uh, the lineup uh, from now until lunch, uh, we'll start with the it will be ETV, it will be Live SA, it will be Wikimedia, and then uh, Sapla, and then the CPA. So without uh, any rest of time, uh, if uh, ETV is, is ready, uh, the floor is there. Yeah, mm -hmm. Chairperson, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound like a heckler. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm sounding like this morning. Uh, Chairperson, I have a bit of a challenge at between 1 and 2.30. I have to take my daughter to hospital. Uh, if uh, between the, the lunch period, maybe I'll be half an hour longer. If I, if it can that just be accommodated. Thank you. No, no, that, that, that is noted. We will, we will also have uh, one hour lunch just to allow the team to also uh, have lunch and then come back uh, around that time. Thank you, Honorable Ambassador. Over to you, to ETV, media. Uh, good morning, Honorable Members and Acting Chairperson. Um, my name is Philippa Rafferty. Um, I represent ETV and the eMedia Group. Um, I was just wondering, uh, for the presentation, uh, are, is it going to be... Uh, shared on your side or must I try and share it from my side? Um, Ms. Rafferty, you have been granted the hosting rights to project the presentation on your side. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. That's before that, uh, Maria, uh, let's just check the time slot there so that at least there is no uh, given the uh, sharing that we have. Uh, in terms yes. of the how many minutes do they have? Um, 30 minutes, um, Jay. From 10 plus 10 to 22 11. Okay, brilliant. Okay, thanks. Wow. Over to you, uh, yeah, you uh, Rafferty. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just waiting for, for my colleagues to, to share the presentation. Um, just give us one. Uh, then let me just, let me do it. Are you able to see the, the presentation, Acting Chairperson? Yes, yes, yes. It's okay, great. Great, then we can, we can begin. Uh, as I said, uh, thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Thank you for this, this time, uh, this opportunity for us to present to you today on the Copyright Amendment and the Performance Protection Amendment Bills. Um, I'm just gonna get straight straight into it, given the limited time period. No, it doesn't want to work. Um, as I explained, um, I my name is Philippa Rafferty. Um, I'm the head of legal and regulatory affairs at eMedia. I have with me today uh, colleagues from the law firm of Rosengarten and Feinberg. That is David Feinberg and Daniel Baskin, who will be assisting me. Um, and, you know, at the outset, we just uh, wanted to express that we are... We have participated in this process around the Copyright Amendment Bill from, from the start. Uh, we're very uh, grateful for the, the changes that have been made um, and the process um, getting up to this point. Um, and we do still feel that there's a, a number of issues that possibly need to be addressed, which is why we wanted to participate in these hearings today. And that is what we will be discussing. So if I could just do a quick introduction about uh, eMedia as a group, so you understand who we are. Um, you will know, of course, uh, uh, that eMedia has a wide range of interests across broadcasting and production. So of course, uh, there's eTV, which is um, a licensed commercial free-to-air broadcaster. eTV has been around since 1998, so we're going on to our into our 25th year of broadcasting. Um, and obviously, you know, we have our flagship channel, which is 
ETV, uh, but of course there are a number of other channels, including um, a number of other free-to-air channels, including eMovies, eExtra, eReality, um, and these channels are broadcast across a number of platforms um, and are available as widely as possible. Uh, and that includes platforms like Analog, DTT, we're on satellite being DSTV, and of course our own OpenView platform, um, which has been around for a number of years. Then of course, you'll know uh, that eMedia has interest in, uh, we run the 24 hour news channel called ENCA, uh, which is broadcast on DSTV. And most recently, uh, we launched our own video on demand platform, which is called EVOD, which we launched in 2021. And this offers our content as well um, in, in the online space. Um, and it offers it on a free and paid for basis. So we can move on just to uh, some opening comments. As we said, we are very grateful for this opportunity to participate in these hearings. Uh, and we very much support the, the process that has uh, taken place so far. And we support the progressive steps that have been taken to modernize this legislation. Um, I think it's important to, to note that obviously this copyright legislation is far out of date um, and due to which we've seen, particularly in, in broadcasting, it's made the need to update the, this legislation even more important and more urgent. Uh, but saying that, we do believe that uh, any changes need to be future-proofed um, and updating um, this, the legal framework needs to be undertaken in a manner which makes it as future-proof as possible. Uh, that's just given the technical infrastructure that is required for broadcasting um, and how quickly that that can change and which we have seen that change uh, in the last 20, 20 so years of, of ETV being in operation. Um, and, you know, as we say, any le legislation in our view that would have the ability to reduce the rights of uh, the copyright owner um, would negatively affect on the viability of broadcasting. And that is our, our, our main concern, I suppose, uh, over the current draft of the bill, um, is that we, we do not want uh, that legislation to negatively affect uh, the creation of copyrighted works. And we believe that any new legislation needs to modernize our approach to copyright, but while maintaining the interests and the commercial viability of broadcasting and television production, um, which is really uh, an essential service. Um, and I say that because broadcasters are essential, not just as a, a part of our economy um, and commercial viability, but they're also an essential part of our democracy. Um, broadcasters have a duty to provide news, current affairs, and entertainment. Um, and these duties are obviously uh, set out as part of Section 16 of the Constitution, which guarantees our right to freedom of expression, and that includes the right to receive information. Um, and this makes ensures that broadcasters are critical agents in ensuring the public has the ability to, to receive information. Um, and as a, as a licensed broadcaster, of course, ETV has a number of um, license conditions, uh, which is attached to our license. And these include conditions around the broadcasting of, of local content. Um, we, we are required to broadcast a, a minimum number of hours of local content every year. Uh, it also includes license conditions around skills and, and training. And, you know, we adhere to those conditions very strictly. So now if I can hand over to um, my team members, um, they are going to start by uh, discussing some further aspects. Thank you. Good morning, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members of the Select Committee. Uh, despite the name that appears at the bottom of your screen, my name is in fact David Feinberg and I'm a partner at Rosengarten and Feinberg Attorneys. Uh, it's a great honour to address you this morning on two bills. 
uh, that we're discussing that if passed in their current form will not only have an impact on e-media, but on broadcasting and on content production as a whole. Um, e-media has made substantial a substantial written representation to you for this morning's purposes, given the, the understandable time constraints that we're under. Uh, we will not deal with all of our submissions as made in the written uh, representations, and we're going to focus on two primary issues, those being the value chain, which I will address, and the issue of ephemeral rights, uh, which my colleague Daniel Baskin uh, will address. Pippa gave you a comprehensive background about e-media. We're sure, and I suppose we hope that some of you might watch uh, soapies like Scandal, which has just been renewed for a new season commencing in uh, April 2023. Uh, the, the importance of content production in our economy cannot be underestimated. Television series like Scandal alone results in uh, over 100 people in the supply chain being compensated. As an entity who commissions TV series, ETV pays for the creation of these TV series. And when I say TV series, I'm also referring to films, but I'll just use those terms interchangeably for current purposes. And these are then made available via its platforms. Uh, it's, it's imperative that ETV has control over the TV series that it produces. And of course, this stands to reason. Uh, if you make something that you want to sell in a market, you need to ensure that you have control uh, over, the, over the supply of the product. Uh, this is necessary to recoup costs, hopefully turn a profit, and then continue to create content and contribute uh, to an industry uh, and, to, and to the economy. So that I can give meaning to the comments that I'm going to raise on the two bills, a little bit of context around the production process. Um, so for this, I'd like you to imagine that you're sitting at home, uh, you're, you're watching your favorite television series and what you're seeing when you're watching that series is the film that is in front of you. And, and as part of that, you will see different actors they, they may be, or they will be reciting different words that emerge from a script. Um, and, and you may also, for example, hear music in the background um, at different parts of the, of the production. So when you see it in this way, you see the film. But if you are to take off that lens of how you watch it as a viewer, and you are to apply a legal lens to how you view that content, um, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Because what we are then looking at when we are watching a film is we are watching the combination of a number of copyrighted works in the first place, as well as the fixation of a number of different performances of the performers who render their performances on that production. So to give you an example from a copyright perspective, the kinds of works that you will see when you watch a film are obviously the cinematograph film itself which in the parlance of the Copyright Amendment Bill uh, is now referred to as an audiovisual work. You will, of course, uh, be listening to the dialogue that emerges from a literary work, which is the script. And you'll also be hearing musical works and the recordings, the sound recordings of those musical works. All of that is what is coming through uh, when you watch that content. I included in this, as I mentioned, are a number of performances that are then fixated. Now, importantly, the works that are created, so in the example I just gave, cinematograph films, literary works, musical works, sound recordings, those are the subject of copyright. Uh, the fixation of the performances are not the direct subject of copyright. These are the subject of performers' rights. And this is, of course, relevant when you consider that we are looking at two bills. One, the CAB, whose focus is or ought to be on copyright, and the other, the PPAB, which deals with performer rights. Next slide, please. Thank you. So a quick summary is that ETV creates film or series that people watch. Um, these films are made up of a number of copyrighted works and the fixations of performances over a number of individuals. And this content needs to be made available to the public. And in order to do that, ETV requires control over the film. Uh, any diminishment of that control could impact on the commercial viability of the production as a whole, as Pippa alluded to. Uh, the same is, this isn't only for ETV, of course, the same can be said of film producers in general. 
Um, and this brings me to present our particular concerns that, we, that I'm going to address you on this morning on Section 8A of the CAB and Section 3A of the PPAB. These two sections seem to do similar things. They give protection to performers whose performances are fixed on audiovisual products. The challenge in the first place is that we have these two sections in two bills regulating one issue. And on that note, the first point that we make in our submissions is that the matter of performance protection is distinct from matters of copyright. And this is why the Performance Protection Act exists to regulate this very issue. And we've therefore made the submission that the issue of performer remuneration ought to be regulated by the PPAB and not by the CAB. I'll explain to you that that is not the case in the way that the current bills are drafted. But it is for this reason primarily that we have proposed in our submissions that Section 8A of the CAB should be removed. You might ask, well, what's the harm if it stays in the CAB as well as in the PPAB? Well, if it stays in, then we submit that the two sections, as they appear in both of these bills, are irreconcilable. Both sections say that performers who perform on audiovisual works must be compensated. But the CAB on the one hand says that this compensation is predicated on the use of copyrighted works. Whereas the PPAB on the other hand says that the compensation is for the fixation of the performer's performance. Those are two distinct matters. And the question then arises as to whether it is intended that a performer will receive two royalty streams, one arising out of the CAB and another arising out of the PPAB for slightly different things. And this is not clear from the bills. A further concern that arises is that the, it concerns the form of compensation. In the PPAB, the form of compensation that is required to be paid to a performer whose performance is fixed is a royalty or equitable remuneration, the one or the other. Whereas in the Copyright Amendment Bill, that bill states that the remuneration is a royalty. And no mention is made of equitable remuneration in this section of the Copyright Amendment Bill. To make matters a little more confusing is that Section 8A of the CAB says that that section is subject to the Performers Protection Act. And again, we, we submit that all of these challenges will be overcome if Section 8A of the Copyright Amendment Bill is removed and that that matter is left in the Performance Protection Amendment Bill for regulation. Turning to slide 13. If it is the case that Section 8A of the Copyright Amendment Bill in fact grants a performer an immutable right to a royalty, um, then this is opposed by us. And, and we say this because we want to make the point that the amendments don't distinguish between the different types of performers that render their performance uh, on an audiovisual work. Um, and the reality is that in any given work, you will have uh, the featured actors, you will have minor actors, and you will also have extras who participate in that. So to give an example, uh, from my own life is back in the day, probably around the same time that ETV started first broadcasting uh, for extra cash. I would put up my hand with an agency and I would get gigs where I would act as uh, a background or an extra um, on, on certain soapies like Generations and Sea of a Delan. My job wasn't very difficult. All that I had to do was to sit in the background, pretend I was reading a magazine or something like that, and I'd get paid hard cash in the form of a couple of hundred rand in a check and that's what I needed and I was elated to receive it. And at that time, had a producer said to me uh, something along the lines of, look, David, come in. Uh, we're going to have you, you know, perform on the show. You're going you, you're gonna to stand in the background for a couple of hours. You're not going to get a check. We're not going to pay you anything for it, but don't worry. Somewhere down the line, we're going to give you a royalty. And there's no guarantee that you'll receive that royalty, but you might, and, and that would be cool if you were to receive it. And to that, I would, to that proposition, 18-year-old me would have said, no thanks, because I needed the cash. And that's part of the challenge, is that the bills do not distinguish between the types of, of performers. 
Uh, while a royalty might be satisfactory compensation for a lead actor, it, it probably won't be for an extra. Um, for an extra, uh, they would have to settle for the possibility, but not the guarantee of being compensated in the future. The performer would also have to know in that circumstance uh, that the royalty that they were going to be paid may or may not be paid, depending on whether the film turns a profit or how that royalty is to be calculated, a point that I must say is not dealt with in the legislation. Um, and also it would have to be shared with a pool of different performers. So that royalty would be considerably fragmented. Uh, next slide, please. We, we of course accept that there is space for regulation to bring balance to the creative industries to ensure that performers are protected. And this is a noble and needed intervention, but it's important for us to mention that a royalty is not a panacea. What makes matters worse is that the CAB provides that the minister will be granted the powers to regulate the contractual terms that apply between the parties. So the minister is granted the rights in terms of the CAB to determine the royalty that is applicable. And the fact is that these matters concern a complex series of commercial negotiations and transactions. Th that, that's what goes into the making of a television series. And a royalty is not the silver bullet to, bullet to fix the lamentable situation of many South African artists who struggle and sometimes die as paupers. Other legis legislation has, of course, worked to protect vulnerable persons, such as the Consumer Protection Act. And this act protects consumers from unfair agreements and unfair business practices. However, in giving such protections, the CPA does not go so far as to have the minister prescribe what price needs to be paid for a particular good or for a particular service. That would be a step too far. And that is what the CAB uh, states that it will do. It will provide for the price that a producer or an owner needs to pay for the services of, of a performer. The point is, the mandatory payment of a royalty will not fix the problem of the poor treatment of many performers. Uh, and this is a larger issue that we say requires political intervention. Just going to slide 15, uh, a brief summary. We suggest that section 8A uh, be removed from the CAB. We leave performers rights in the Performers Act. Uh, we remove the restriction on the party's freedom to contract. And we remove the power of the minister to determine the royalty rate and contractual terms. I'm moving on to my final slide before I hand over to Daniel to address a distinct, a very different concern. Uh, this slide relates to section 22 of the Copyright Amendment Bill. And that section states that notwithstanding the life of copyright in literary work, section 22 says that there is a term limit of 25 years for the assignment of the work of a literary work for the for, for those rights and that those and that, that that there is a compulsory reassignment to the author that means that after 25 years if there is a script that is incorporated in a film the rights in that script will revert to the author and it must be pointed out that there may be many authors of a script uh, and what then happens is that from our perspective is that after 25 years, there may be a number of different authors that we're going to have to try to deal with to secure the rights to continue to make the film that we've invested in, to continue to make that film available to the public. And if we are unable to do that, and we may not be dealing with those authors directly, we may be dealing with their descendants and executives at that time. If we are unable to secure those rights, then the film uh, or the audiovisual work uh, could could face an, an early death and it, it, we won't be entitled to exploit it. That's because uh, if we don't clear the rights from all owners of the copyright, we would not be entitled to sell and continue to make our film available. If we did that, we would face possible infringement proceedings and there would be a good basis for those infringement proceedings to be commenced. It's also worth noting on this point that the 25 year reversion provision also applies to musical works. So if you have, if you have someone who has composed a score for your film after 25 years, that is placed in jeopardy and you have to go back and try to secure the rights. It's, it's untenable. Uh, Section 39B of the act suggests that we would be prevented from contracting out of that. And 
we, we say that that these provisions uh, need to be need to be removed too, uh, because they will impact the industry in such a way that there will be a chilling effect on the ability of of people to invest in the film market. If people invest in film, they need to know that they have the rights to receive revenue for the life of copyright. And if that is then diminished because it is placed in jeopardy through performers' rights, we then have a real challenge. On that note, and of course, I've gone through this as quickly as I possibly can. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you very much for hearing us. And my colleague, Daniel Baskin, will now address you on the ephemeral right. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Honorable Chair, and thank you, Honorable Members. Um, Honorable Chair, I note that we started five minutes late in our allotted time. We would just request an indulgence to go five minutes after our allotted time, if that is in order. Uh, if not, we will do our best to fit in our submissions in the next five minutes. Um, we will appreciate that you, you stick within five minutes. Uh, thank you. Because of the pleasure. Thank you, Honorable Chair. We will, we will I will do my best. So, Honorable Chair, on that note, I'm going to be dealing with a very specific issue. Uh, Mr. Feinberg dealt with uh, quite a broad overview of the content commissioning chain and the effects of the bills on that on that uh, on that process. I'm going to be dealing with something quite 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 a lot more straightforward, and it's called the ephemeral right. Uh, it's a right afforded across most foreign jurisdictions to broadcasters, uh, and the right. If I can summarize it, it's to cure a very simple issue faced by broadcasters when broadcasting live events. And the issue is this, uh, when a broadcaster is out broadcasting news or perhaps broadcasting a sports event, they may incidentally and unintentionally broadcast or reproduce a work of copyright in that broadcast. And they may do that without the authorization of the copyright holder. Now, if I can give you some examples of how that how that might how that might occur, I'll just give you one. Considering the time we have, uh, if if you could imagine uh, for a, for one wonderful moment that South Africa is hosting the, the Rugby World Cup once again, and imagine even more wonderfully that the Springboks have won. There's a, uh, uh, a song plays out in the stadium. Everyone is dancing, having a wonderful time because we've just won. The broadcaster who is recording or broadcasting the the event. That song, maybe let's say in Calicata for the purposes of argument, is now coming through your speakers at home. What's happening on a legal front is that that, that musical work, the literary work and the sound recording, which makes up that song, we don't need to go into the specificities of the music industry at this point, but what's happening is that that work is being reproduced by the broadcaster without the consent of the copyright holder. This, of course, is an issue. So the way legislation around the world has dealt with this is by introducing the ephemeral right. And we have it in our Copyright Act. It's at Section 12, Subsection 5A and B. Now, considering the limitations I have on time, I won't be able to read out the, the right to you, but I will. The, uh, the section will show up on screen in the next slide. Um, and I can say to you that our, our, our submissions are not a criticism of this because the bill maintains the right nearly word for word. Um, but what it what we think what immediate e thinks uh, there's, there's, a, there's a very good opportunity here to extend the right. Um, the right itself is subject to two conditions. The first is that the it must be the the ephemeral recording must have resulted as of the lawful activities of the broadcaster, meaning it cannot be uh, someone who is not a licensed broadcaster or it cannot be an act that is intentionally trying to use someone else's work without their consent. It has to be a lawful broadcast vis-a-vis -vis our, uh, our broadcast of the live sports event uh, example. The other requirement is it has to be destroyed within six months unless it is of an exceptional documentary nature. Now, our immediate submission on this point uh, is that the opportunity here should be to extend the right. Um, and it can be extended by, as follows. One, uh, the condition that it, that it has to be of an exceptional documentary nature before it is deleted should be removed. Further, the temporal limitation, i.e. the six months we have, should be removed. And the, and the answer is quite simple. Um, uh, whether something may be of an exceptional documentary nature, could probably only, well, more than likely not be known uh, after a period of six months. Uh, it also ignores the fact that in the case of a broadcaster, a news broadcaster is probably the 
as, as the archive seen as a cumulative whole, uh, includes the national history of a country through, through reporting news on a daily basis. So that the, the value in that archive should be maintained. If any of the broadcasts include an ephemeral recording, there's a statutory obligation to delete that. Rather, we say uh, the exception should remain, uh, but the, ob the, the, the two obligations to delete based on time or based on it being of a documentary nature should be removed. And any further use of those recordings should be subject to fair practice, which is a position the Act already regulates. I hope I've managed to summar summarize that in five minutes. Um, these, these submissions are set out in our written submissions, but e-media would like to thank the, se the select committee and thank you, Honorable Chair, for the, for the opportunity to present. And should there be any written uh, requests for, for any drafting suggestions or any further questions, we would welcome the opportunity to, to submit those. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you. You were you were very efficient with time. You were just undermining uh, yourself to <laughs> that in five minutes. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I, I yeah. I really went through it, but I hope the point was made. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, to uh, Emilia uh, for for the presentation, uh, uh, which was led. Uh, uh, definitely by uh, by uh, uh, the uh, perfection. So what I will then do at this point in time, uh, I will uh, ascertain from members as to whether are there any clarity scheme questions that they want to pose. Uh, no discussion because we'll have ample opportunity as a committee to, to engage. Just that discipline questions. I've noted uh, the hand of uh, Honorable uh, Protestant. The floor is yours. Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson, if you don't mind, I'm going to leave my camera off because of low signal and uh, you know these difficulties. I do apologize, Chairperson. If, if my signal improves, I will go back to camera. <laughs> but okay. Chairperson, there's just, there's just two questions I want to ask to the presenters, and I thank them for their presentations. And and the first one is, you know, the, the issues they have raised are, are very serious, particularly the issue about the, the minister being able to determine royalties, which I think, uh, frankly, I must express the opinion that that seems to be a massive overreach of, of, of the ministerial power in this regard. Um, so the first question I have to ask, and, and I don't want to put the presenters on the spot, but if the bills go through as they currently are, with the, with the difficult consequences that they will present, do, does e -media con, is e-media contemplating litigation in this regard? I think that's extremely important to know for us as a panel, uh, as a committee. And then secondly, um, another bill that we're dealing with tomorrow, Chairperson, is the expropriation bill. And the expropriation bill defines property not just as immovable property, but it leaves it wide open. And of course, it, it defines something that is very relevant to this entire discussion, which is intellectual property. And well, what is the presenter's feelings, feelings about the fact that, in essence, if the expropriation bill goes through as it is, that there will be the power of the government to expropriate intellectual property? Thank you, Chairperson. Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you, T. Honorable Mashoff. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I also wanted to speak to the intellectual property aspect, but my colleague, Honourable Bar to say they've done so. Thank you. Well, thank, 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 thank you, uh, Honourable Bosho. Uh, let me check whether there are any other members. Maybe I must, I must, I must uh, then come in uh, uh, just to just to uh, put some questions from my side uh, because. Uh, I think the, 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 the presentation uh, uh, at the beginning to touched on the on uh, uh, trying to explain to us uh, what uh, what does what 
well, the the chain and chain. Uh, say that the the, the, the you would uh, commission a, a production company uh, upon payment to pro, to produce uh, a series, and uh, that uh, a commissioning will be uh, entailed in a written agreement and. Uh, in order to have a totality of control in terms of all rights, uh, you will then uh, have uh, all rights uh, to each of the episodes. So, uh, 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 that you are in terms of assessing your rights, but also controlling all of the rights. in the creation of the bundle of rights and the exploitation of, of work. Uh, and you are saying that it is not beneficial to the, the creators and authors it is meant to protect. The, the question that I want to, 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 to ask is, uh, uh, don't you see this uh, Control. Uh, the, 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 the second point is uh, uh, if you see uh, the the two the two section in terms of the value chain is an existential threat to the media production as a whole. Uh, uh, don't you think that uh, the uh, uh, intervention by the by uh, by the uh, uh, minister uh, is, is, is particularly aimed at uh, uh, protecting some of the the rights that necessarily might not have been uh, uh, captured by the full act? And what is your view with regard to? To, uh, to, to what would you advise the community with regard to other presenters that, will, that, 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 that are supporting uh, the, the act, not only by being from the fact that uh, our, our copyright act is, is old and it has to be brought in line with the, with the new, with the new uh, 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 law, but also, uh, also with the what's happening in other countries. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I will start by addressing the first two questions uh, which were raised by Honorable Brataset, and then I'll hand over to my colleagues to address the the question that you have the questions that you have just raised. Uh, so the first question. Uh, which you which you expressed, um, honourable member, being uh, whether or not uh, we are contemplating legal action if the bills go through in in their current form. I think um, I think all broadcasters would seriously consider legal action. Uh, this is obviously not something that just affects uh, ETV or E Media. It would affect. Um, DSTV, it would affect the SABC. I think our as well. argument on that one is, is kind of irrational. Um, sorry about that. Um, and it would certainly our freedom of speech are certainly be something that we would uh, contemplate um, legal action over. Um, and then the second question around the expropriation bill and the expropriation of, of intellectual property, I think that is. Um, 
uh, also a serious, serious concern for, for broadcasters, uh, which really, um, as, you know, as we've explained, uh, a lot of our assets uh, as a broadcaster are tied up in IP itself. And I think uh, the current form of the expropriation bill would have a chilling effect um, on that commercial viability um, of being able to do productions. Um, and it would be it would be a very serious, um, serious threat that we would have to have to consider how to how to deal with. Um, I'm going to hand over now to my colleagues to deal with the other questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Raveti. Over to you. Thank you. So, uh, Chair, to your questions um, concerning the operation of the two provisions that we've made reference to and the uh, potential existential threat um, to the industry considered against, uh, I think, the, the, the opportunity to find a way to give further protection to performers. That is a much uh, needed intervention. I think that, you know, as a general proposition, we uh, accept that some form of political intervention would be required or would be welcome to, to give further protection to performers. Uh, there is no doubt, and we all know, um, we all know of stories of, of great South African talents who have uh, struggled to make ends meet and some who have, who have died as paupers. But what, what we say in that respect, though, is that the, the manner in which that is, if that is intended to be dealt with in the form of the protection, uh, the Performers Protection Amendment Bill, by imposing a royalty that will be determined by the minister. Our submission, um, and obviously this is contained in detail in our written submission, but in our verbal submission too, is that the royalty is not going to be the remedy to, to that issue and that it is not uh, an appropriate place to legislate uh, in that respect. So whilst, whilst the, the, the purpose is uh, a welcome purpose, the, the solution, if it is that, that is being offered in the legislation uh, does not, on, on a balance of all considerations, does not uh, come to assist uh, the industry, or we would say, for the example, even the written submissions, uh, all performers too, because there are too many questions that arise as to what that royalty is going to be, how it will be determined, and also whether it's payable on a profit position or not. Uh, so then you are placing risk on the success of a production in the hands of performers. And uh, for that and other reasons, we say um, that, that it, is, it is misplaced. Um, I think that as a general proposition as well as whilst we are focused on Section 8A and Section 3A as potential existential threats to the uh, production industry, we have also referred to other concerns in our written submissions. Um, and in particular, I took you through the concern around the reversion of the rights in literary works, which, which could also spell, uh, not to sound dramatic, but, but it, is, it is an apt way to describe it, is it could spell an early death in the life of an audiovisual work that needs to run uh, for the life of copyright in order for investors to be attracted to that type of, of market. Um, and anything that takes away from that uh, has a has a potential uh, chilling effect on, on on the industry as a whole. So, tried to address your questions as you've asked them. I hope that I have. If there's anything else, or if there's any matter that, that we haven't dealt with, please uh, uh, please send over your questions. Well, thank 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 you thank you, uh, team uh, Emilia, uh, under the, the command of uh, Ms. Rafferty. Uh, let me take this opportunity to read uh, I think that you have time about our issues. And, uh, and uh, uh, it is able to, to, to help us in terms of uh, contextualizing uh, uh, the angle from which we come from. And uh, we are much more clear in terms of uh, your, your input. Uh, thank you for, 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 the, for, the, for, for honoring uh, the invite. Uh, uh, to to comment, we will definitely, as part of the of the, of the engagement, 
uh, ensure that we take heed of the issues that we have, that we have come back with us. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we will then thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rappachi. Uh, we will then uh, move to the next, uh, the next uh, presentation, uh, uh, which uh, will be from uh, Section 37, uh, Planned uh, South Africa. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and members of the Select Committee. Uh, I'm Chase Naya, representing Blind SA and Section 27. I'm going to start first by playing you two very short video clips, and then I will highlight uh, some of the matters that you wish to raise. Thank you. Unfortunately, there is no audio. There's no audio. Yeah. We'll check on that. No audio. To help give someone's words wings. There was a time when South African students. Come far enough. Blind people experience a book famine, and sighted people don't. When a blind person's rights are affected like this, justice hasn't come far enough. It's time to stand together again. It's time to demand change. Ending hashtag ending the book famine. Hashtag there is no crime. This oral submission is presented to the NCOP in support of the written submission to be made on the 27th of January, 2023. Blind essay and section 27, organization profile of section 27, The organization profile of Blind Essay. Public interest. We are generally in favor uh, of the Copyright Amendment Bill. Uh, Can you just work on your, on your, on your, uh... Uh, audio because you are not uh, audible, uh, Mr. Jaisi. Yes, give me a second. The audio is not audible. But we are fine now. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. My apologies for that. We are generally in favor of uh, the, J the Copyright Amendment Bill. Uh, however, there are uh, some uh, amendments that may uh, re be required uh, to fall in line with the Constitutional Court uh, the judgment 
of uh, 21st uh, September 2022. The, the amendments that uh, I refer to, uh, I will highlight a few of them uh, in this presentation, but all of them are included in the written submission uh, in detail, and we also provide language in certain instances, and we would be available uh, uh, to provide greater clarity and comment. The instruments. The, the focus uh, uh, of our submission is based on uh, three important uh, instruments. The first, of course, is the Copyright Amendment uh, Bill. Uh, um, which Jesus, is, uh, sorry, Mr. Nigri, if I, if I may, um, they seem to be having some difficulty transitioning from, from, from slide to slide. Can we offer to project the presentation on the behalf? Would you be able to follow me? You uh, can. They want, they, they want to come to a rescue, uh, Mr. Nair. Uh, will be, will you, I, I hope it will make things much more easier for you. Uh, my dear, okay. do that as long as uh, it will not disrupt uh, Mr. Nair's ability to communicate. Okay, I'm on, yes, I'm on instruments. Uh, you can, I can stop. Uh, yeah, maybe we can just stop there until then uh, the, the uh, yes. Yeah, let's see if you can follow with me. I'm on the slide that says instruments, and the focus is on three uh, instruments. The first is the copyright amendment bill, uh, which is uh, uh, before the select committee at the moment. Uh, the second is the cost. Constitutional Court judgment of 21st September 2022. The third is the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works to blind, visually impaired, and other print disabled persons, which was adopted in 2013. The next slide talks to the Constitutional uh, Court judgment of 21st September 2022. You, you are aware that you have 30, 30 minutes now, Mr. Nair? Yes, yes, I am aware. Great. Okay. Uh, the Constitutional Court uh, focused or centered its uh, judgment based on the need for authorization uh, by copyright owners for us to have access uh, to uh, published works and which was not forthcoming. They were also uh, aware of the deliberations that are taking place on the Copyright Amendment Bill. Uh, the, if I can move on to the next slide. Okay, accessible format. Uh, accessible formats. This is the first recommendation we make. Accessible formats include Braille, uh, large print, audio, and DAISY. These are the methods that blind and partially sighted people would uh, communicate with, and be saying that um, the uh, the definition uh, given by the Constitutional Court uh, is in line uh, with the Marrakesh Treaty. The next one is beneficiary persons. And we believe that there should be no change to this. Uh, the wording in the Copyright Amendment Bill uh, includes all the, the disabilities, uh, and we believe uh, should uh, remain.
The next one that I want to focus on is uh, technical protective measures. Technical protective measures limits our access to information. And the example I cite is that if a person is uh, downloading an ebook uh, at a library, uh, for instance, or at a university or at a school, and they need to uh, then have that converted into Braille, for instance, and there is no uh, facility for that to be uh, embossed into Braille at that facility, they will need to email that to another device so that it can then be transcribed uh, into Braille. Uh, I highlight those uh, three uh, aspects uh, in terms of uh, some of the changes that need to take place. Then I move to the slide on concluding summaries. The, the recommendations uh, is in line uh, with the Constitution of South Africa, the Copyright Amendment Bill, the Constitutional Court uh, Judgment, and the Marrakesh uh, Treaty. The details and the language and the wording uh, is in the written sub, uh, submission. The first one is uh, on the definition of accessible formats. Which I've, uh, which I've just explained. Uh, the second one is on the definition of beneficiary persons. Uh, the third one uh, is a definition of permitted uh, entities. We believe that uh, the Constitutional Court uh, crafting of permitted uh, entities is more inclusive uh, and is in line with the Marrakesh Treaty. The Copyright Amendment Bill's uh, definition of authorized entities uh, puts the um, approval uh, on regulations uh, pro 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 proclaimed by the minister and we believe that uh, that again uh, creates further delays uh, in the remedy that the Constitutional Court granted in providing immediate relief. Uh, and I would like to focus on the next slide. One uh, of the Copyright Amendment Bill, uh, this made uh, operational immediate uh, to uh, to the court, uh, the Constitutional Court, uh, reading in uh, Section Thirteen A, uh, which uh, firstly. Uh, declared uh, that the 1978 Copyright Act is unconstitutional uh, to the extent that it limited uh, our access to the right uh, the, in the Bill of Rights, uh, the equal equality, uh, as well as participation in cultural life. Um, Section 13A uh, is aligned uh, to the Marrakesh Treaty uh, and uh, the Constitutional Court provided, made provision for its suspension or its invalidity for suspension for uh, two years so that Parliament uh, could cure the defects uh, in the Act uh, and um, in the interim, uh, we would have immediate access 
uh, the two uh, exceptions and limitations that would allow us for transcribing uh, of uh, materials into Braille and large print. Uh, we also highlight uh, section 19D, two and three uh, of the cab uh, that would require uh, to ensure that uh, these provisions uh, do not unintentionally uh, uh, prevent the making of uh, accessible co uh, copies for instance, copies the blind essay are made accessible. Uh, uh, there's no need for another library to make that accessible. It could share that uh, uh, to another person who requires to read that in that accessible format. Uh, so section uh, 28P, uh, uh, we believe uh, uh, in terms of uh, technical protective measures, uh, the, the subsection two uh, should be deleted because this again places the burden uh, of getting authorization uh, from uh, the rights holders and the constitutional court of, uh, declared that that it is unfair discrimination for blind people uh, to go and get authorization, uh, whereas non-blind people do not need uh, to get authorization. Uh, then we also, on, the, on edge, we support uh, the section uh, Charles uh, D, Charles D, and 19C on uh, education uh, and other exceptions that are granted, uh, because the these also benefit the access to information and knowledge uh, for blind, visually impaired, and other print uh, disabled persons. Yeah, thank you. Those are the matters that we thought that we would want to highlight uh, in addition to the written submission that we made, uh, the details of uh, uh, the amendments and the language is in the written sub submissions. And we are available uh, for consultation or to provide clarity uh, on any of these points. And uh, chair and members of the committee uh, blind and partially sighted people uh, have been living through this book famine. So it's time uh, to end the book famine and uh, Braille is not a crime. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure, my pleasure, Mr. Jaina, for that presentation. Let's just uh, assess from the platform members any Participating questions uh, from, uh, from, from, from uh, honorable members in relation to the presentation. Uh, the, the presentation from Blind SA, which is section 27. It, it looks like we are very clear. It looks like we are very clear. Just, just one question from my side. In line with the the, uh, the judgment of uh, September uh, 20, I think it's 21 or 22, uh, which obviously was, was uh, prompted by the, uh, the delay, which uh, uh, the thrust of the case was that it continues to, to perpetuate uh, a discrimination uh, uh, of people against, uh, I mean, with visual and uh, uh, disabilities. Uh, the, 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 the amendment that we are posing, uh, 
the amendment that we are proposing, uh, because uh, if, if, if let's say uh, we the uh, the national the national council of provinces agree with the amendment, will it not further delay the very same the thrust of the challenge that you had with in terms of the delay? That's that question. Chair. Yeah, uh... Because that would mean that uh, we'll have to send the thing back to the to the National Assembly for them to be able to take this amendment on uh, on public consultation because uh, uh, the one that was adopted by the National Assembly did not have uh, this uh, comment and probably maybe other committee members might not have had an opportunity to also comment on that. Yes. Chair, the judgment of September 2022, uh, we believe pr provides Parliament the two years in which uh, to rectify some of these defects. Uh, the amendments that we are proposing are not substantive uh, amendments. Uh, it is uh, amendments that will firstly align the uh, Copyright Amendment Bill uh, in line uh, with the judgment as well as with the Marrakesh Treaty. We believe that the, the judgment uh, is a baseline. It, it, it provides uh, for the minimum requirements and parliament um, has uh, the obligation to meet its constitutional uh, obligation and commitments. And therefore uh, the provisions that uh, the, the, the Copyright Amendment Bill uh, provides uh, should be higher than what the court has set uh, uh, as the basis. And therefore we do not feel uh, that um, uh, the amendment that we proposed uh, would uh, cause any further delays uh, in executing. It is uh, in line uh, with the fundamental principles uh, of the Copyright Amendment Bill so far as exceptions and limitations uh, for persons with disability. Thank you, thank, thank you, Mr. Ne. Uh, Tim, I saw your hand up. Mr. Chair President, was, um, you know, my, my signal is poor, so I'm not sure if I missed the point, but Chair President, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who's in favor of open source documents, so that, that learning and education is open source. But I wondered if Mr. Nye could just complain comment on how do we marry the two? Uh, if a person has written a book, they've used the intellectual property to do that, is, it is their livelihood. How do you marry the, 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 the rights of a person who has spent considerable time writing a book and considerable amounts of their own intellectual input and property with the fact that we must, you know, obviously assist Societies like the Blind Society to convert that to Braille. Um, how, how do you marry those two? It's it's a, for me an ongoing conundrum. How you marry open source with the rights of the person who's written the book? I don't know if that was already covered in the presentation. She, I didn't hear it, but maybe Mr. Nair can speak to it. Mr. Nair, yeah, chair. Uh, first, let me say that. Uh, even blind and partially sighted persons and other persons with disability are authors, are performers, uh, are composers. Uh, so uh, the, we, we see a balance uh, in that. Firstly, um, it, uh, the, uh, the rights owners uh, are producing material they're providing information, and I am unable to read that material. So all we're asking is for that material to be made in an accessible format. And if the uh, publishers are able to provide that material in an accessible format, uh, like in Braille or large print or uh, the DAISY for us, then why would there be a need for uh, uh, non-profit organizations like ourselves to reproduce it. We too then can walk into a bookshop 
and purchased that book or walk into a library and borrow that uh, book that's available in an accessible format. That is all we are asking for. Who knows, this could create a niche marketing opportunity uh, for the publishing industry to provide us with accessible formatted material so that uh, we can have direct access to it uh, and we can get access to that uh, on the same day and the same price as uh, everybody else purchases a book or borrows a book. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Anna, for that uh, response. Uh, and uh, uh, also take this opportunity to also express uh, my gratitude on behalf of the committee for the uh, invitation. But I see Sonia has a uh, hand up. Meryl Boshoff. Thank you, Chair. I'm in load shedding, so I'm also losing you from time to time. I've written things in the chat. Um, oh. Section. So, if we can just have a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let let me let me go to that. Uh, oh yes, 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 yes. Uh, on the on 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 the chat. Uh, uh, going back to the going back to the intellectual property section two three one of the constitution requires us to respect all international conventions. If we expropriate an individual's IP, we will be in breach of Article 14 of the Covenant. I don't think this one, uh, this one uh, uh, will need your response. Let's go to this one. Going through with these two amendment bills, we will be screwing writers, musicians, filmmakers, and academics. It will also allow government to use split of textbooks so that he doesn't need to pay the textbook writer to their work. And then the other one is from Brenda. Uh, what form of challenges will people with disability faces previously? And if this bill is amended, what will they benefit out of it? Uh, I hope you can be able to, 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 to bless this uh, chat, uh, Mr. Ne. Yeah, Chair, certainly. Uh, if I can just talk to the current position, uh, only 0.5% of published works is available in accessible formats. Uh, and most of it is in English, some in Afrikaans, and very little in our African languages. Therefore, it immediately limits our access to information, our access to textbooks, our access to re reading material. And then that, that in turn limits our access uh, to gaining uh, uh, access to university and tertiary institution, uh, getting uh, professions and uh, qualifications so that we could make a meaningful contribution. Uh, there are exceptions uh, of people that have uh, been able to, to, to achieve this, but that's because of support from their families or uh, from other institutions that enable them to get these materials produced in an accessible format. The majority of blind and partially sighted people do not get access uh, to this basic information. And therefore, uh, all those opportunities are limited. With having access, it can create the opportunity for economic well being better education, access to jobs, and hopefully uh, we would be able to become uh, 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 contributing members of, the, uh, of our economy by contributing taxes uh, and so forth. So uh, uh, the, these acts uh, would immediately provide access to, 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 to books that are accessible, uh, uh, in other countries uh, to, that we can bring into to, for, so that we can make, uh, it would also make it possible uh, for us to reproduce these books because less than 10% uh, of publishers have given us permission uh, to reproduce these books. And there are very few publishers who have made 
uh, accessible copies of the print as well as Braille uh, doc, uh, books immediately available. There are a few, but very, very few. And we're very grateful to them for that. So I think the, the passing of these two legislation will immediately uh, bring an end to the book famine. Uh, it will not make us criminals because currently the 1978 Act makes us criminals because we we are not supposed to transcribe these materials without the written approval of uh, the rights holders. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ne, uh, for that uh, response. And let me again, uh, on behalf of the committee, take this opportunity to express gratitude to you and the organization for, for uh, responding. And uh, <clears throat> uh, also, uh, uh, for responding to the, not only the invitation, but also to the uh, questions that were sought by, by our members. I see there is the last one from uh, Angarabu Sonia Oshoff. It says we must take into consideration that only seven of 47 registered countries throughout the world are making use of fair use. So this explains why fair use is not beneficial to the writer. If we go ahead, we must adapt the fair use to our country. What is your view with regard to that? Uh, I'm not familiar with the statistics, but I know uh, fair use is uh, used in a number of countries and uh, we support fair use and we believe that it would uh, provide us the opportunity uh, to reproduce uh, particularly educational uh, research uh, texts uh, so that uh, we can advance uh, uh, academically, scientifically, and so forth. So uh, we believe fair use has not, uh, is not detrimental uh, to our economy. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Nair, for that response. Again, uh, our gratitude to you. Check and and I just, any last word from you? Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. I also want to apologize for the technical glitches uh, we have. I think that's part of what we talk about, you know, reasonable accommodation. Uh, and uh, uh, we're grateful that uh, the, the, the team at uh, the your office was able to step in and provide some remedial assistance. I hope that uh, the members of the committee were able to follow uh, the slide, uh, but we have forwarded it to your office so that it can also be circulated in support of our written submission. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Nair, for, for your participation. Uh, what we will then do now is to move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, the next presenter will be from Wikimedia. Uh, if the representative of Wikimedia can take the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you yes. all hear me loud and clear? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, Mr. Dapla Scott, I see that's you on the platform. Excellent. Thank you so much. And can you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, it is quite possible. Fantastic. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank um, um, th thank you all for allowing me to present here today. Um, first, a bit about uh, the organization I'm representing, uh, Wikimedia South Africa. Uh, I'm the point person of Wikimedia South Africa for uh, advocacy, uh, specific, specifically on this issue of copyright advocacy. Um, so Wikimedia South Africa, we are a non-profit membership organization that exists to represent Wikipedia editors and other free knowledge, free open knowledge movement uh, people in the in South Africa in the country, and we've been around if since you 2012. Don't, if you, don't, you can just show your face, uh, just uh, so that at least the public is able to see uh, who's representing Wikimedia. If you don't have any challenge with that, 
I'm afraid I do have a challenge with that. My my video card is is not cooperating with Zoom. No, so, no, no problem, Mr. Scott. But, but you can't. But you can see my face in that in that picture yeah. in that group photograph there. It's it's amongst the ocean of people there. That that <laughs> photograph is a, is a group pic photograph from our last um, chat, uh, um, our, our last community meetup, uh, the Wiki and Daba event that we have every year. Um, so Wikimedia South Africa, along with the other Wikimedia chapters around the world, in addition to representing Wikipedia editors and promoting the open knowledge movement, we also promote um, uh, free knowledge and free knowledge, uh, both free as in free of cost, but also as in free, free to add. Um, knowledge uh, freely that is in the public interest and so that's essentially what wikipedia is all about the free online encyclopedia um, wikipedia editors are all of our members are unpaid volunteers um, i always encourage everyone to give editing wikipedia a go so please uh, do give editing wikipedia a go yeah, just just don't do any conflict of interest stuff um another important Thing to mention about our community is that uh, when it comes to copyright issues, we take the strictest possible interpretation of copyright law, and that is to protect um, the Wikipedia uh, project, the Open Knowledge Project, as well as to uh, protect the, uh, the the unpaid volunteer editors that contribute to it. But also, very importantly, we really want to respect the copyrights of creators and people who create content. We ourselves, when we create content, such as um, adding new sections to Wikipedia or adding uh, content, creative content artwork to illustrate Wikipedia or the other projects, we uh, surrender our copyright. We, that, that's something we do voluntarily. Uh, we release it under an open copyright license. So it's all begs the question, why do we care about the CAB, the Copyright Amendment Bill? Because this is something we care very strongly about, we, we care very deeply about, and we have uh, two uh, strongly held opinions on it. And I'm going to start with the opinion uh, that we hold most strongly, that we have most strongly. And um, it relates to a concept called freedom of panorama. What is Freedom Panorama? I think a good way to explain what that is, is um, explaining the story of how we as a chapter uh, got involved in the Copyright Amendment Bill. Uh, back in 2012, uh, one of the first things that our uh, membership organization did was to organize a photographic competition to celebrate heritage. In South Africa, it was part of the largest photographic competition in the world. Wiki loves monuments. It's a global competition. We were organizing the South African component. And um, we really wanted to celebrate all of South Africa's heritage, um, especially recent heritage, such as uh, monuments uh, celebrating the struggle against apartheid. This is very important to us. And, and Luki Loves Monuments exists to, uh, it invites members of the public to take photographs of monuments, which are then uploaded to Commons, which is where photographs go to live in Wikipedia, so that they can be used in Wikipedia to illustrate Wikipedia articles. Now, one of our, you know, this, we, we, we announced the competition. About a week later, one of our members, very correctly it turned out, pointed out to us, that um, what we were doing was opening us up and our participants and the, uh, the Wikipedia project up to litigation. It was exposing us. Um, and the reason why, and it was, it was also a violation of the strictest possible interpretation of copyright law. And the part that was in violation was the fact that we were inviting members of the public to take photographs of um, publicly publicly visible works of art as publicly visible works of art um uh, that were recently made in addition to the old ones right so essentially what we had to do and this photograph that you can see here illustrates what this means it means that we could not accept photographs of recently built public works of art um, but we could accept photographs of old works of art, of old publicly uh, visible works of art, old public works. And the example here, which is a very good one, in the Nelson Mandela statue outside the Union buildings, um, that is recently built. We cannot, on Wikipedia, we cannot accept photographs of the statue and other statues like it in South Africa. But you'll notice that the facade of the Union building in the background 
is not censored out. And that's because we can accept those because the copyright on that has expired. Um, they basically um, things in South Africa, we have 50 years plus life of the author. The union building was built more than 100 years ago, exceeding 50 years plus life of the author. It is safe for us to host images of um, these, these works on Wikipedia. The Nelson Mandela statue. It is unclear who exactly owns the copyright, but one thing is clear is that it's recently built. We might maybe be in um, uh, exposing ourselves to litigation if we hosted this image on Wikipedia. Now, it's not the photograph itself, it's not the copyright, the photograph itself that's a problem. Um, I took this photograph um, and I donated this photograph to the Commons. I uploaded it under, uh, it under a Creative Commons license. What is the problem is the distribution of the likeness 